It's Monday, May 16th, 2022. I'm Jonathan Lau, and this is 5 Minutes of Proof, a weekly analysis of the science behind ozone therapy. Today, we're going to look at an article that was authored by uh, Dr. Gregorio Martinez. I've met him. I um, believe he's Cuban, lives in Italy, he, a pharmacologist there. Um, and he wrote this paper entitled Practical Aspects in Ozone Therapy, Study of the Ozone Concentration in the Ozonized Saline Solution. It was accepted into the Ozone Therapy Global Journal in 2020. And this is important because it helps us to understand how ozonating saline works. So let's take a look. The purpose of this study is to um, paper is to study the concentrations of ozone in saline solution during the bubbling stage to establish the optimal saturation time to study the degradation of ozone in it over time, thus defining the need for continued bubbling during reinfusion to the patient. Keep in mind, this is in reference to intravenous infusion of ozonated saline, which we don't really do in veterinary medicine. However, we do use it subcutaneously a lot and then topically which is a different thing altogether as far as how it's reacting and responding and all of that. But uh, nonetheless, this is going to be helpful. The use of ozonized physiological saline solution, they'll refer to it henceforth as O3SS, is a widespread practice in Russia and developed by the Ozone Therapy School in the city of Nizhny Novgorod. Okay, so I think it's really cool that there is an ozone therapy school in in russia um and so that's in, that's important this route of application was approved by the ministry of health of the russian federation in the early 80s ukraine made its application official in 2001 um, a little bit uh ironic that we're talking about those two countries right now um so O3SS and MAH, or major autohemotherapy, are two systemic forms, each with its advantages and disadvantages. And so they're pointing out here that um, you, can, you can use this method in place of really major auto um, and that they're both systemic. Uh, so systemic administration methods, but we don't have to draw blood is the basic advantage when we talk about saline solution. Um, again, we don't really use it that way in uh, veterinary medicine. I wanted just to note that the saline solution temperature was about room temperature. So you're looking at about 74 degrees Fahrenheit um, is what we're talking about. So if you have colder uh, fluids, remember, those are going to saturate at higher concentrations. Now, this is crucial to understand. So figure two shows the changes of the concentration of ozone and saline solution. In saturation phase at the concentration of one microgram per milliliter, the maximum concentration was 10% of the initial, corresponding to 0.1 microgram per milliliter after 10 minutes of bubbling. For concentrations of five micrograms per milliliter, the maximum concentration uh, was 0.5 micrograms per milliliter after 15 minutes of bubbling. So what are they doing? They're ozonating saline at very low concentrations, one microgram per milliliter of ozone and five micrograms per milliliter of ozone. You'll notice that they, when they do intravenous infusions of ozonated saline, and this technique comes from actually Russia initially and then the Ukraine, um, they're going to ozonate it at very low concentrations. And the concern in going really high is that different hyperchlorites and uh, different elements are going to be um, infused into the vein which could have a detrimental effect if they're too high. However, that's been debated heavily um, and not really proven um, as far as it's, it, it hasn't been proven that that is a problem. So here's what they showed. Basically, when they ozonated it at one microgram per milliliter, um, after 10 minutes, they had uh, just 0.1 micrograms per milliliter. After 10 minutes, at five micrograms per milliliter, they had 0.5 micrograms per milliliter. So very, very, very low concentrations. And then they show here that over time, um, the ozone decomposed quite rapidly actually. Um, so that at 15 minutes, um, you're down to maybe a quarter of what you had to start with. Um, so that's pretty significant. Um, and faster than we see 
um, in general, I would say, or the, that we've taught people in general. Um, there is varying information upon, on this. So they reached about 10% of what they actually put into the saline solution. So if we do it at 20 micrograms per milliliter, we may only get two micrograms in there. Um, and we might get more than that, but it depends on, again, the, the solution itself and the temperature as well. There were other studies that showed you got between 22 and 25% of the saturation um, that you, of the ozone uh, concentration you put in. So um, this is reiterating what I, what I just said above. Uh, it's, it's interesting information that they found here. Um, their theory is that at five micrograms per milliliter, when you ozonate it at that level, it's sufficient um, that you shouldn't go over eight micrograms per milliliter when you're doing intravenous ozone infusions. That doesn't apply when you're not doing intravenous ozone infusions. Um, and again, their concern is the production of hyperchlorites and, and other um, components that they believe at large doses could be somewhat cytotoxic. Um, so the main mechanism by which ozone acts does not require large doses, but rather the oxidative preconditioning sing signal is transmitted from exposed to unexposed cells. Bocce's concern with this was that it was too low of a dose really to do anything. Um, and, and yet studies that have been done on COVID-19, uh, most recently uh, in 2021, I believe, um, show that there is some effect there. So um, for what it's worth, uh, that's the information I wanted to give to you today. Uh, this has been 5 Minutes of Proof, and we'll see you next week.